I'm going to talk today about uh, Unified Parallel C, or UPC, um, and more generally about this class of languages into which UPC resides called Partition Global Address Space Languages. And I'll just say up front, for, um, there are instances of these languages for Fortran. There's Coalray Fortran, which is actually now being put into the Fortran, it has been put into the standard Fortran spec, or at least parts of it have, and, um, and there are versions for um, other languages um, as well. So, um, but I'm going to mostly talk about UPC. That's the, the project that we have here at Berkeley. Let me just get a show of hands. How many people are kind of uh, very comfortable programming in C. Okay, good. All right. And um, so, so the rest of you may, I, I don't have a lot, of, a lot of C code in here, although some of the signatures and things will um, mostly be familiar syntax to people who are used to programming in C, but um, you can take these ideas, as I said, and apply them in another context like Coray Fortran. So what are these PGAS languages about? Um, they really came about uh, because of um, uh, the difficulty with programming in a message passing style on very large scale machines for a certain class of problems. And um, <clears throat> if you think about uh, message passing programming, what most programs look, at, look like in an MPI style is you divide up some physical domain into pieces where each processor gets a piece and, um, and you compute locally on each one of the pieces and then you exchange some information with the other processors. Sometimes it's more complicated where you need to do some kind of an all to all communication pattern as it, if you're doing so something like a, uh, um, an elliptic solver, an FFT, um, that you might have to do some kind of um, more, more complicated exchange. But basically, your, your programs tend to be written in a bulk synchronous style in, in MPI. Now, um, and we can get more complicated than that. But it, it works pretty well for problems, uh, for physical simulation problems, because there's a lot of inherent locality in the world, which means that a lot of the computation can be done locally on a local piece of the domain. And um, you don't have to communicate all the time. Now, in contrast to that, imagine that you're trying to build a hash table that keeps track of all the web pages in the world. Um, so you take this hash table, and it's too large to fit in the memory of a single processor or a single, single node, shared memory node. So you spread out the hash table over a very large scale distributed memory machine. And um, so each processor owns a few buckets, and you're trying to put items into it. The problem is with a send receive programming model, as you have in message passing, that you don't know when to say receive, right? So a processor um, that is looking at a stream of keys that are, or whatever of, of these you know, web pages and says, oh, this, this web page goes into that bucket over there that's owned by this processor, you can send a message to that processor, but that processor doesn't really kind of know uh, whether to say uh, what, that, that, that something is being inserted into one of the buckets of their hash table. So that doesn't say it's impossible to write such a program in MPI. You can do that. You have a little uh, you know, progress loop that just says receive, 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 but it's kind of awkward. Um, and so global address space programming is really getting at this problem of uh, what happens if you need to do random access into, your, into a very large memory space. Um, and they're called global address space languages because they also lie sort of in between shared memory um, and, and distributed memory. And I'll, try, I'll be hopefully more, more explicit about what that means. So what are the, just to kind of compare why we would want something in between the two, in a shared memory programming model like OpenMP, uh, which you heard a lot about, there's, it's very convenient. You can often take serial code, and it's not a huge amount of work to, um, to get that code to parallelize, or at least parts of it, loops to parallelize. It's, um, you can share the data structures, so a lot of times you don't have to rebuild your data structures. Um, in some cases, you can just annotate the loops, and uh, it just is, it tends to be a simpler programming model for most people to use. It's, it has no control over locality, right? Your data structures are all just sitting in this, this kind of blob, um, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't scale well, so you can't really run it um, outside of uh, on, on a shared memory space um, on hardware. People do have distributed memory implementations of shared memory that, that send pages around, but in general, um, it, it's not a very good programming model if you, because you don't have any locality control, you're going to end up with very... Um, very poor network behavior because you're going to move a lot of data around. And you do have race conditions. You have this problem that two, two processors can write to the same variable or one of them can read it while another one's writing it and get um, unexpected results because of the ordering. Now, in the message passing style, the, the biggest advantage is scalability. It's the reason that MPI is the most popular programming model for writing large-scale um, scientific applications on these large machines. You get very good locality control, which is what gives you scalability. And, um, and the communication is all very explicit, which means that it's much harder to write a program with a race condition. It's not actually impossible once you start using some kinds of asynchronous communication, um, but it's very it, it's, it's not kind of uh, easy to do. And so 
Um, and it also means that your, the cost is very transparent. Messages are expensive relative to computation, and you see all of that in the code. The disadvantages is that it tends to be much more difficult to take a serial program and rewrite it into message passing. You have to um, pack and unpack your data structures, and you have to figure out where to say receive. And that's really, as I said, one of the main things that PGAS languages will, will um, look at. Now, <clears throat> what you've heard about, um, you've heard about both MPI um, and OpenMP, so, so these two um, kind of canonical instances of those two programming models. Um, what a lot of people do, and in fact, this is what we recommend um, in the NERSC Center for most of the users, is they mix these two together. That is, you use message passing between the nodes and you use shared memory within the nodes. Um, most of our applications that are running at NERSC um, are actually uh, run either pure message passing code, and there's probably about a quarter of them now that, that use a mixture of message passing with OpenMP. So it's becoming more popular to add OpenMP because of the uh, uh, multi-core nodes. So, um, you know, now if we, this is some, these are some performance results looking at what happens when you try to uh, mix together OpenMP and MPI. And um, this is for a particular application. I believe this is Paratech, which is a um, material science code, and it's, uh, but it is very communication intensive. So this one is a little more dramatic than any others, but the kind of characteristics I'll talk about here are representative of what we see a lot of, across a lot of applications. So. Um, what the graph has is um, this exactly the same amount of hardware being used at every one of those points, um, and the, the time you see is the y-axis, and, um, <clears throat> um, and the different data points along the x-axis is how many of the cores are used as OpenMP threads versus MPI processes. Okay, So same amount of hardware in each place, so you might expect to get a completely flat performance line. The red bars are the running time. Uh, the blue line is the memory usage, and the um, but you can see there's a big difference in the running time. So um, it's much better to to use more than one OpenMP thread. Uh, one is certainly is the the worst case. So that says all MPI is not a good model for this particular application. And um, so now as you add um, more and more MPI threads. Uh, what happens? So, so why is that? Why is one MPI thread not the right model? First of all, um, it uses a lot of memory. The blue line is also at the peak, and um, and it has fairly high runtime overheads for sending messages. So, if you've got shared memory hardware, it's kind of a waste to <coughs> end up copying your your state into a buffer and then shipping the buffer across um, the uh, across the bus because uh, or the the interconnect that's um, within the the shared memory system. On the op on the other hand. Um, as we add more OpenMP parallelism, um, you can see things get faster for a while, and then it starts to slow down again. Why does it start to slow down? Well, it's this issue of not having locality control. And so um, at some point, you actually want MPI's locality control more than you want the um, kind of convenience and low overhead of, sense, uh, of using shared memory directly. And so um, that starts to, it starts to go up. So the, the optimum in this case is um, three OpenMP threads per MPI task, typically on this, this architecture, six is about the right, three to six is about the right number. That's because of the, the um, actually, yeah, this is not on the hopper system. On the hopper system, it's usually six because there are six cores in what we call a NUMA domain. Um, there's shared memory between two NUMA domains um, and that, uh, within the, or actually within four NUMA domains on the node, but each one of those is faster within that, that set of six. So usually six is about the right number. The, the red bars tend to vary a little bit across different applications. Um, some of them scale much worse. Um, and some of them scale much better as you add more OpenMP threads. It depends a lot on how well the OpenMP th uh, code was written, and also on uh, you know how much uh, how bad the locality pattern is for the algorithms that you're running. The blue line is very consistent across um, the different applications that we've looked at, and that is to say, uh, an MPI application, all MPI will use a lot more memory has a much larger memory footprint than one that uses more OpenMP threads. And that's because there's state associated with MPI itself um, for message, bu message passing buffers and things like that, and also that there's, um, there's state that is replicated in, at the application level. When you write an MPI program, you're going to take some of your variables and probably make a copy of them on every processor so that every process has um, an instance of those. Um, so, what you can see from this is that the tuning question is a little bit non-obvious, so a mixed model is, is not um, is is really what is very popular. But the question is, can we get a single model? Um, and PGAS will also address this problem um, of trying to, to give you all the advantages of shared memory, and all, or at least some of the advantages of shared memory and some of the advantages of message passing. So 
Uh, and I, I started out by saying that we're, we're, lo we're looking at this, these kind of irregular applications. Um, and indeed, that was these kind of random access things that are all the way on the right on my irregularity spectrum, a kind of a loose spectrum. But these random access things um, were indeed the, the kinds of applications that were for which um, UPC and other languages like this were designed. Um, if you look at simulations, there are the two, two groups in the middle. And I think of them as either being nearest neighbor computation or things that have very uh, much more uh, higher volume communication, all to all sort of computational patterns that come up in there. Um, but at the other, the left end of the spectrum are things that basically do no communication. So a bunch of independent jobs, what we might call humiliatingly parallel um, uh, sets of activities. And uh, so those, and we use those a lot in data analysis. Um, interestingly, we use them for kind of the first stage of data analysis. This is a picture of the internals of the Large Hadron Collider. They spread work out all over the world, actually, and do because there's a lot of independent jobs that have to analyze the, um, these, uh, the, the detector um, output. Um, but also for data analytics, if you really want to do something like graph analytics, you tend to end up on the other end of the spectrum. So modeling and simulation are kind of in the middle. Data analysis or data analytics tend to be on the far left and on the far right in terms of irregularity. So if you're really interested in graph analytics, um, you know, random matrix problems and random graph sort of uh, structures and things like that, um, then you then then the uh, th this is what PGAS is really designed for. It turns out, and I'll say a little bit more about this at the end when we talk about the performance of UPC and other PGAS languages, that it, it also has an advantage um, for all to all communication because you can very efficiently do communication in these languages. So there's really two advantages of the PGAS languages. One of them is convenience, especially for these random access problems, and the other one is performance because the overhead of communication is lower. So I've been talking a lot about why you should care. Here's the cartoon, a canonical cartoon of what a PGAS language looks like. Um, so what, is the, what, what does the term mean? It's, uh, so it's partition global address space language. So um, a PGAS language, first of all, has to have a global address space. That means that a thread can directly read or write remote data that, that lives on other, uh, is associated with other threads. Um, that's certainly true in a shared memory model. Um, it's also going to be true here, and it's going to be true globally. That is, a thread can read or write data um, that's anywhere in the system. Um, it, uh, it means that we kind of hide the distinction between whether the, the hardware is shared uh, or distributed memory, um, that you're going to be able to get a pointer, for example, and um, point to data that's anywhere else in the system. Um, partition then is added to this because, um, and this is why it's not a shared memory model, partition says that the data, the data is going to be designated, and this will typically be in the type system, as either being local or global to the thread. And so um, this is very critical to scaling of these, these um, uh, programming models that, uh, that you do have control over locality. So here, our picture down here, we actually have two parts of the address space. The yellow part on the top is the shared part. The white part on the bottom is the private part. Each processor or each, each process or thread has its own piece of the private space. It also has its own piece of the shared space. And you can point, the processors can have pointers that point to other processors' shared objects that are up in the yellow region, but not down into their private region. Um, the, the exact details of privacy and how that works and what things you can point to do, do depend a little bit on the, um, the, the different PGAS languages. They take different, uh, different views on that. But that kind of overall picture is what a PGAS language looks like. Um, feel free to answer question, ask questions at any point, but you might have to wave a little bit because the lights are pretty bright. So maybe you know that from previous speakers, but it's hard to see uh, the, all of you very well. Okay, so I'm going to talk, do a little bit of a tutorial, then talk about the performance of UPC. We'll start with the um, UPC execution model. Uh, I will also mention that um, there's a much larger set of slides online that, um, that are being uploaded to the website than the ones that I'll show here. Um, rather than trying to go through 85 slides in an hour, I thought I would uh, um, go a little bit slower, but, um, uh, but there, there are more details if you want to see them online. Um, so here's a Hello World example in UPC. It should give you a basic idea of what UPC looks like and kind of what the execution model of the UPC program is. It's very much like an MPI program from this standpoint um, in that it's a single program multiple data model. What that means is every process um, that is, is going to have its own copy. You can think of it as its own copy of the main function and all the code, and um, they're going to simultaneously run that code from the beginning. Now, they don't stay in lockstep, step, so one of the threads can go off and call another function that other threads do not call, um, but they will, they will proceed um, down the, uh, through, through the same, same code. So in this case, 
Um, we're just writing a little hello world example. So the only things that are different than a usual C-based um, hello world example are this include statement that brings in the standard definitions of UPC and the fact that then you're using two of those, my threads, which tells you what thread ID you are, and threads, which tells you the no total number of threads in, the, um, in this particular instance of the program. Um, so I, I should say, it, as it says at the top, that any legal program, C program is a legal UPC program. And so that's, um, it may not behave in the way you want it to behave, but it will get through the compiler if it's a legal C program. And so that's actually very convenient. One of the reasons, um, one of the things that's nice about C is you can take a lot of, or UPC is you can take a lot of C code that you've written for other purposes and reuse it in this kind of a parallel context. Okay, so we're going to have, um, the, this is the basic execution model. Now, to do anything interesting, we need to have some variables that we can share between them so we can do some kind of um, communication. So, um, as I showed you before in the cartoon, there's really two different parts of the address space, the private part and the shared part, and each thread has kind of a piece of each one of those. Um, so normal C variables, when you just declare them, are put into the private space. And if you do a regular old malloc, um, so dynamically allocate something, um, that's going to end up in the private space. Um, <clears throat> if you instead um, put the keyword shared in front of a variable, it's going to go up into the shared space. Now, this particular instance is a, just a shared scalar variable, not particularly interesting. And in fact, we don't use these kinds of variables very often in UPC programs um, because it's, it's going to get allocated on thread zero um, in the shared region. And now any other processor can, any other thread in the UPC program can go ahead and access that variable. Um, but it has certain problems. One is uh, you have to protect it with a lock um, but the, or something like that to make sure that you don't have race conditions. But the other problem is um, even more fundamental that there's a bottleneck. So if you've got a million processors and they're all trying to access thread zero, you're going to get very bad program behavior. Um, but this is kind of the basic, uh, basic building block that we'll use to build uh, other more interesting data structures in UPC. Any questions? Okay. Um, so a more typical thing to do is to use a shared array. Um, and shared arrays by default are cyclic, um, but they can also be blocked. So here's a couple of examples. Here's a, um, and the, the pictures are down here for each one of those declarations. So um, shared int x uh, threads, it says this is a, an array that lives in the shared space. And the blue uh, square in each one of those tells you which elements of that, that array are owned or have affinity to uh, thread zero. So um, in, in the first case in x, there are only threads elements, so each one of them has one. And, and and we're showing a picture here for four threads. So each one of them has, um, has one of the threads. And so thread zero just owns the first one. Um, y has uh, more elements. It has three times the number of threads. Um, it's actually in C. We can, we're, we're writing this as a, as a two-dimensional array, but it's always useful in C to think about what the underlying memory layout is. Um, unfortunately, that, that is really kind of fundamental to C, and it's something that UPC inherited. Multidimensional arrays in UPC or in, in C are not very powerful. They're not very abstract. They're really just a chunk of memory in which you can index them with two indices. But that's what the um, array layout for Y looks like, and there's Z. So you can see that it wraps around. If there's more than threads elements, then that you just wrap around to the first element, the first thread again. Okay, so we've got the ability to build shared variables. Now we need to be able to protect them um, so we don't have race conditions. Um, the, probably one of the most popular um, uh, synchronization constructs in UPC is very similar to an MPI. It's a UPC barrier. So this is just going to block all of the um, threads until all of them get to the barrier. So you can imagine in that you can write things in UPC that are in that, that bulk synchronous style that I talked about at the beginning where you do a bunch of local computation. You then uh, synchronize, you, you wait on a barrier, and then, for example, you write into remote regions or you read from remote uh, from, from um, variables that are on other processors in order to get some uh, state that you need in order to compute again. Um, UPC, the, the other philosophy, um, there, I mean, there are a couple of philosophy points with UPC. One was to be consistent with C, both in its philosophy, which is a fairly low-level programming language, and also to be, um, and also to try to minimize overhead um, in, in any way that we could do that, to try to give programmers a tool to get the best possible performance out of any machine. Um, and so uh, one of the things that is expensive is a, a barrier construct is an expensive construct, um, especially as the machine becomes very large. Um, and also, if there's any kind of load imbalance in your, calc in your computation. So in some computations, you can separate the work that has to be done 
before you can go into the barrier, um, and some other work that may, be, may not depend on everybody, every, all the other threads getting to the barrier. So we have what are called split phase barriers. UPC notify says, I'm ready for the barrier, uh, but you can go off and do some other work. And then UPC wait says, now I really need to wait for the others to be finished. Um, you can, there's also a way of adding a labels. This is really just a convenience. Um, it, kind of make, it makes your code more read, readable, and, um, and the, the, the labels then have to line up when you call a barrier. Um, so now, the other form of synchronization, of course, is locks. Um, and hopefully you saw something like this in OpenMP. Um, the, there's a special type in UPC called a UPC lock T, and um, you have to you dynamically allocate them so you can put them inside of data structures, you can put them inside of uh, arrays and things like that. And um, there's a, a couple of different ways of doing that. You can either use what we call a, um, uh, a uh, collective version of it, and the all underscore that's in the first name there, this all right here, is saying that all the threads are going to get together to allocate one lock. So there's one lock that's allocated, and all the threads are going to get a pointer to it. Um, as with the other case that I talked about before, that thread is by default that that lock is going to sit on um, on thread zero, in, in its shared region, so all of them could get to the lock. Um, then there's also just a, a regular un, um, what we call a non-collective version of it, which is global lock, um, and that will allocate one that's on the the um, calling thread. So just one thread allocates that one. After you do something like this, you might want to broadcast that a pointer to that lock, so every other thread has a copy of it. So the the way in which you use locks is pretty standard. You just you use a, a lock and then an unlock statement with the code that you want to protect. So for example, access some shared variable um, in between those two statements. And you should clean up your locks when you're done using the free statement. So I'm going to give a short example here uh, to show a little bit of code and hopefully make this more concrete. Call this Monte Carlo, Carlo pi calculation. We're going to estimate the, the uh, value of pi by randomly throwing darts at a unit square. So there's a little picture there. What we're going to do is calculate, um, for each point, we'll calculate an x and a y. And we'll say, if x squared plus y squared is less than 1, and then it's in the red region, otherwise it's in the white region. So we'll calculate the ratio of the red region to the white region by adding up how many hits we have. How many times do the, um, does the dart uh, land in the, in the red region? And then use that, um, the usual formula for pi to um, uh, the area of a circle to, to give us the uh, estimate for pi. So we'll get four times the ratio will give us um, a value of pi. OK, so here's um, a little bit of code. Um, that, that will do this, and I'll try to walk through this a little bit. So first of all, we have, um, there, here's our main function. Our shared variables, if they're going to be regular shared variables, have to be declared out here. I think this is actually left over from an earlier version of the code, and we don't need this hits variable in this, but that's what a, a shared variable declaration looks like. Um, here's our, um, we're going to uh, read in some arguments. Um, here's all the threads that are that are um, accessing the arguments. So this is sort of standard C code for those of you who are familiar with it. It shouldn't look too too strange um, to convert those arguments in. And everybody, every processor is going to calculate how many darts they're supposed to throw. That's the number of trials, and they're going to then. Um, uh, See, uh, initialize a random number generator. That's the SRAN statement. And then we'll go into a loop in which we call a function hit that's going to either return 0 or 1, depending on whether or not that is in the uh, um, inside the unit, squ unit square or not. So as I said before, there's more code online if you want to see that, but it's a pretty trivial um, C function, that nothing interesting from a parallelism standpoint inside there, to call the random number generator and uh, calculate whether x, x squared plus y squared is less than 1. Um, and so we then. Um, and in this case, we're using, um, we're, we're going to locally accumulate um, a value that says how many times we hit, and then so that we're not bashing on that shared variable all the time, and, and I was wrong before, we are using the hits variable here. Um, we, uh, we put a lock then around the update to hit. So this, this code is only going to be executed once by each thread. So this will probably run fine on you know, 16, maybe even 128 threads or something like that. If you get up to a few thousand threads or tens of thousands of threads, you're going to have a bottleneck here in this code, but the code should behave correctly. Any questions about locks? OK. Um, so we've seen a couple of examples of different types of variables. Um, we've had the hits variable. Um, we had the lock variable. Uh, actually, we could also have an array. So this was an all hits array, which I, um, we didn't really talk about. And we can have the my hits, which is a private variable. Notice that there's a copy of the my hits variable on e every one of the threads. So um, the most common things are to use these shared arrays. And um, and then in some cases, we need the, the shared locks and sc shared scalar variables. Privates are, are also very, very common in UPC applications. 
Now, the other way to write that example um, is to get it, to make it more scalable is that you don't want to have um, p threads all incrementing this one variable at sort of simultaneously and asynchronously. Instead, you um, once they've all done their local computation, you gather up the results and you add them together using a tree-based calculation, a reduction operation. So I think you've heard about uh, reductions before, and um, here's how you would one way of writing this in UPC. Um, there is a, a library, and here's a link to the of the library interface code, which is fairly, which is standard and runs on top of any UPC compiler, um, and it does a reduction. And so, you know, the, the signature is a little complicated because reductions can be done in different types of variables, integers and floats and doubles and so on. And um, so the first argument is the type that you're reducing over. Um, the root is the thread that is going to get the result of the reduction or is going to be the source of the broadcast in the case of a broadcast. Um, value is going to be the input and output variable. It has to be a, an actual variable that can be written into, so you can't put an expression in for value. And then the, oper the operation um, is a standard set of predefined uh, UPC operations over which you can do reductions like add, multiply, min, max, and so on. Um, so those are, the, um, th those are the different ways in which you can do reductions. And th this is useful for many of the kinds of um, initial things that you would want to do reductions over. Um, there's, there's both computational collections, like reductions and, and parallel prefix or scan operations. Um, and then there's things like broadcast and scatter and gather, which, which move data around but don't do any computation in the middle of them. So um, UPC has a much more general um, form of collective that's also defined in the language. It's a fairly large part of the specification um, and is something that is still under debate um, in the UPC language design community as to whether or not um, that should be uh, expanded or redefined or whatever. Um, and so you can, in, in that case, you can do collection, collectives over arrays. So it uses this distributed array, the shared array um, construct more directly. So you can say, I've got a big array and it may have, uh, you know, a thousand elements per processor or different numbers of elements per, per thread. And, um, and it'll do a collective over that. So it's, a very, it's very convenient, but it also has a much more complicated interface. And so I think this value-based one is, is fairly simple and uh, avoids some of that complexity. So here's how we might write pi in UPC in what I call a data parallel style. So data parallelism is where you're really using a lot of these tree-based operations. All your communication in a purely data parallel style would be done using, say, reduction and broadcast operations and things like that that are all in a single, uh, in a single operation, which is, has a well-defined behavior independent of how fast or slow the different threads are executing. So... Um, so the previous one wasn't very scalable. Here what we'll do is just at the end where we want to, um, we want to after we've computed my hits, we'll then do a reduction operation, um, which is um, over, over all the my hits variables. And notice that then um, thread zero in this case is the, is the root. And so thread zero is going to get a, um, the, the, the sum of all of the values that the other, very, uh, the other threads all had in, uh, in the my hits variable, including its own value. And so then it can print it out at the end. Okay, so you can see that you can you can use uh, pretty easily both a uh, this kind of par data parallel collective style uh, programming in UPC, and you can also use something that's much more asynchronous, much more OpenMP like, or really P threads like, if you will, where you have different threads that are doing diff completely different things, and every once in a while um, they acquire a lock and access some shared variable. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that just just for convenience, really, um, maybe to, to help the compiler and optimizing your code a little bit, that we do is, is a work distribution. So how are you going to spread out work? Um, well, uh, initially, as I said, each thread is running the main function. So you can divide up work as we did in the, um, the pi example by just saying, uh, you know, each one's going to do a certain number of operations, and that's really how we divided up the work. But a lot of times you want to do something, um, for example, dividing up an array. <coughs> or something else, some other data structure that you want to divide up. So a common um, statement is to have a, a, a for statement in which each thread is going to execute a subset of the iterations of the for statement. So UPC has a UPC for all, which is, um, which is a parallel statement, and it says that each thread um, can execute the loop body in parallel, so it's giving semantic information to the compiler that it's okay to execute the body of this loop, the statement here, in parallel and not worry about race conditions. That is, it's not the compiler's problem to worry about uh, your whether your code has race conditions. You're stating when you use the UPC for all that all these, um, these iterations are independent. Um, and it looks just like a, a, a C loop that has got an initialization, a test, and a, a loop, which is, means the, the increment, the loop increment. So, you know, something like for i equals, for, for i equals zero, i less than n, i plus plus here at the bottom. 
um, it would be a typical sort of um, C loop. And But a, a very common thing to want to do then is to say, um, if I'm going to loop over all of the variables inside here, check to see if i is currently equal to my thread. Um, my, so I, I mod the number of threads is equal to my thread, because that says in a cyclic array layout that I own this particular piece of the data structure. So that's kind of what it's saying is, do I own this, this, uh, this, this set of um, variables that, are, that are, would be cyclically laid out um, by default? So you can, uh, you can use this kind of, a, what, what we do in the UPC statement then is add this expression called the affinity expression, and the affinity expression is something that tells you, uh, what, what tells the compiler what to check to see whether or not um, you should execute this body of the iteration. So this, this statement, um, using the UPC for all, um, can be written by just putting the, a, uh, this, this um, putting something like i in the affinity expression will give you this behavior down here of the conditional in there. Now, a compiler can do a little bit better job than that. Rather than executing on every thread all n, n sort of iterations and then just jumping out of um, p minus one of them or threads minus one of them, it, the compiler will do something more clever, which is to start i at my threads and um, increment by threads each time. So you're just the, each thread then is just going to jump through the elements that it owns. So here's an example of um, just a very simple vector addition. We've got three cyclically distributed um, arrays that are um, declared there, v1, um, v2, and sum. And we're just going to go through them using a UPC for all and add up the elements um, from v1 and v2 and put the result in sum. These are all um, aligned together, and, uh, and, so, and they're all cyclically laid out. So putting i in the affinity expression will give you the right um, behavior. That is, the, the, these, each one of these statements will execute on the things that are up in the shared space but have affinity to the thread that's executing. Now, it turns out that we, we may want to use um, other kinds of array layouts, and I'll say a little bit more about those in a minute, um, but I'll just say that we could use a more complicated affinity expression um, in here. We can use the uh, pointer, and the pointer then does a test to say, is this the thread that owns the value that this is pointed to? That is, um, is it in, do, do I have affinity to the thing that it points to? So in C syntax, we can say ampersand sum of i, which says, um, get a pointer to the thing that some of i, where, where, that, where some of i lives, and then what would happen in the affinity expression is that it will check to see whether or not that, that element of some of i um, lives locally, in which case go ahead and execute the, um, the statement. That will be much harder for the compiler to optimize, but it will be easier for the, um, but, but it will be more general, so if you use different array layouts, um, the uh, affinity expression will still work. Okay, so distributed arrays. Um, I, as I mentioned, that we, we may want to change the layout of these arrays. A cyclic layout is a pretty lousy way to lay out an array for anything that involves, say, nearest neighbor co communication. So if you need to do relaxation on a grid, I think when Jim talked about sources, I'll maybe he's doing that next, but anyway, when you, if you've talked about some of these um, operations that are doing, uh, you have a big array and you want to do some kind of a nearest neighbor averaging, having all of the elements um, that, is, uh, that are owned by a thread spread out throughout the array is a really bad way to do it because you're doing constantly doing communication through the network. Um, so instead, UPC gives you the ability to have blocked arrays. Um, and so you, you add an extra piece of the declaration, which is this blocking factor right here. Um, and there's a few different things you can put in here. First of all, you can leave it empty, which is what we've seen so far. That's a cyclic layout. You can say, give me the maximum block sizes that fit with this array. So the compiler will then calculate, and the runtime system will calculate how many elements are in that array, um, how many of them belong on each thread. So um, it'll handle the rounding and stuff like that. So roughly every thread will get the same number of, um, of uh, elements from the array. Um, and if it's not an even, even multiple, then it'll sort of uh, spread out the extra ones for the each, each. Some of them will get one extra element. Um, and uh, you can give it a particular block size, B, um, and put an expression in there if you want to. You can also give a um, what we call an indefinite layout. And this is actually one of the most popular ones, and I'm going to say more about it. Um, what an indefinite layout says is this is an array that lives in the shared space. So it's up in that yellow part of the address space, um, but it all lives on one with, with affinity to one of the threads. So it's just in one of those chunks. And I'll show you why we're going to want to use this. Um, it'll, it'll be very popular for building much more general kinds of distributed data structures. So here's the... Um, the, the, uh, the sum uh, uh, vector addition example again, um, but where I've added a blocked layout, and here's the affinity statement that now use, uses sum. So it would, the code would run correctly 
if I put an I in this affinity expression, right, each thread would actually, uh, e each element would only be added up once, so it, it would give you a correct result. The problem is it would perform dreadfully because each thread would be adding up an element, a, p a pair of elements that live on some other thread m most of the time. So it would be a really bad idea to have that kind of an affinity, st affinity statement. Okay, so we've seen a few different kinds of pointers. Um, we've seen, uh, and, and you can also declare just pointers that are, that are pointing into the shared space. Um, sorry, we, we see, we've seen the different kind of arrays, um, but this is how we are going to build more general kinds of data structures. We'll do it with pointers. Um, and we can have a, a regular old C pointer, which is P1. So what does P1 look like in the picture? P1, whoops, is, should not be pointing quite that high up. Uh, this one should be pointing down here a little bit further. Um, so it's pointing into uh, local memory. Actually, it can, it can point up there because it's pointing on the same processor. So P1 is pointing into the private part of the space, or at least within the local part of the space that's, on this, that's associated with the same thread. Um, and that's just a regular old C pointer, which is represented just like a C pointer is. Um, it's just going to be basically an address in memory. Um, and then you can have a, um, a pointer to a shared space. Um, this would be something like P2, and P2 can point either up to the, um, the space that you have affinity to on your thread, or it can point to some other threads um, part of the shared space. Okay, so these are, um, are, are very popular, and they, um, they get used a lot in order to build your distributed data structures. Um, the first thing is a shared pointer to, to local memory, which is P3 points down like this. Not usually a good idea because um, it's not a very useful thing to put a pointer like that up in the shared space because if some other thread comes and reads P3, it can't do anything with P3. It can store it, but, it, but if it tries to dereference it, it's not going to mean anything um, in another thread. So we tend to discourage programmers from using that kind of a pointer. Um, the last kind that is also useful, um, this is for building things like linked lists um, that live in the shared space. Um, this is a a pointer that lives in the shared space and points to something that's in the shared space. And so this would be something like P4, um, which you can see is building kind of like a linked list data structure. Questions? Okay, so um, I think I kind of talked about what these different, the, the different reasons is that we use each of these, so I won't talk about this slide in detail. I, just to make this a little bit um, more concrete and maybe to avoid some confusion that people often have when they first hear about PGAS languages, there's not a very complicated runtime system underneath UPC. Um, and in fact, all we're doing is playing a trick where when we dereference a pointer, we first of all make a pointer a little bit bigger. So a pointer to shared, something that points up in the shared space, is wider than a regular pointer. It has an address, and then it has to have a thread ID to tell you where that thing lives. Okay, so it looks like uh, this kind of a data structure here. This is actually what a particular implementation looks like. And um, th that means that when you dereference that thing, it'll end up sending a, a message over to that processor to access that, that um, element of the memory space. And so um, that works out pretty um, it, 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 we're not moving anything around kind of behind your back. As a programmer, you still have very good control over where things live and, and um, what's, what's cheap and what's expensive. Now, the last thing that may not be so obvious is something I didn't talk a lot about. This is called the phase, and this is because, um, for better or worse, in C, you can pick up any pointer and you can say plus plus on that pointer. And so the question is, well, what does that mean if you've got a pointer to one of these UPC arrays? And remember I told you they could be blocked or they could not be blocked. And so you have to, the compiler has to keep track of the blocking factor, which it knows, um, but it also has to keep track of the fact that you might be kind of in the middle of that block. And when you pick up a pointer to the middle of some array and you say plus plus on it, the question is, do you go to the next element or do you go to the next processor? And so that's what the phase is for. A little bit of detail, but just to kind of give you some idea of what the implementation does, which is actually is actually a fairly simple. I'm not saying there's not much code in it, but there's a still very fairly simple um, set of runtime uh, issues that have to be dealt with. Now, for building more interesting data structures and to um, that are that are for trees or for linked lists or other things like that, and even for more hierarchical kinds of arrays, we'll use dynamic memory allocation. Um, and this can we, we can use either the um, UPC alloc, um, and this is not a collective operation, so a single thread could call this and. Um, It'll, the calling thread is going to get allocated a contiguous chunk of memory of size, um, which is the number of bytes, and that uh, times the the, uh, the uh, size of the thing that's in there. So uh, you're going to so, so you just do this. Um, sorry, it's the size and the number of bytes. And um, uh, so, so in this case, 
I, what I'm real, oh, there it is. It is correct. Okay, so we're, we're taking n times, and that should, that ampersand should be an, uh, a times thing, four times the size of a double, um, and that's going to give us, um, and doubles that live on processor, say thread thread one, which is um, in, that is re referred to by this variable, this pointer p two. Okay, and then there's a free operation to go along with it. Just like in, U in C, there's, U U C, there's a, an allocation of free. And just to remind you, since every U legal C program is a legal UPC program, you can also just use regular old malloc, and um, that'll put something in the white part of the space, the private space. Um, now we can also use a, a, a collective version of this, um, and this is we can we can use a uh, um, version in which we uh, in which everybody is going to uh, let's say let me say this again. So if all of the threads are executing that statement, we're going to get a picture that looks like this, right? Because I just happened to show you what what was happening on thread one. But if this is in some code that all of them are executing, um, then they're all going to get a, an instance of n doubles um, in, a, in a newly allocated array that's pointed to by their own instance of p2. That's assuming p2 is not sitting in the shared space. Um, but, but a lot of times what you want to do is you, you may want to, if you want more of a distributed array, you may want to allocate a big distributed chunk of memory and then you have every processor point to the beginning of that. And that's done with an all alloc, um, which is going to do a single allocation, but it may be spread out over, it will be spread out over the processors, assuming it's a big enough chunk of memory, um, and it will be divided up into blocks. And then you, um, and they're all, all the threads that will call this, cause, and all of them will call it together, will get a pointer to the beginning of that array. Um, there's another one called a global alloc, which is a little weird, uh, especially for uh, people who are trying to implement UPC. It's not a collective. It does the same kind of distributed allocation of an array, and only one thread calls it, and one thread gets the pointer back, which it could then broadcast or, or put into another data structure that other other um, processors or other threads can see. Um, the uh, the problem in terms of implementing this is other threads may all be busy doing some other computation, and for one thread to go off and call an allocation on their memory space um, just is a little bit a little bit tricky to implement. But to, but it does work in the language. It can be a little slow too. So um, so what do we use these kinds of pointers for? Um, this is in the in our experience in writing UPC applications over the last ten years or so um, at. Uh, uh, here in Berkeley, in Berkeley Lab, um, up the hill, as well as here on the campus, we mostly um, end up with data structures because we have non-trivial sort of data structures that have what we call a directory structure. So a directory structure looks exactly like um, so the one on the left looks exactly like this picture right here, where each um, each processor is going to have a pointer to its own chunk of data, um, but then you build a directory which is a distributed cyclically mapped array in which um, the, that pointer then is, is, um, is in that array rather than being a separate variable. So the advantage now is that array is in the shared address space and any th thread can then get to any other part of this data structure by um, indexing into the directory, this part right here, and it can then get to any one of these other parts of the, the data structure. So how would we use something like this? So imagine that you have, say, a, a 2D or a three-dimensional mesh, and you want to do, say, multi-grid on it. You want to do some kind of relaxation over, um, you know, nearest neighbor calculations or something like that on the mesh. Very common scientific um, calculation to want to do. What you actually might do is build a 3D directory, which is a little directory of pointers to all the blocks that live on other processors, and each one of the processors then allocates its own 3D chunk, um, and what is stored in, in that little directory, and that directory is replicated, so every thread has a copy of that directory, um, and what's, point, what's shared in there is, the, um, is a pointer to that three-dimensional block of memory. And so once again, you can get from anywhere to anywhere. Because the directory is itself three-dimensional, it's kind of a natural way to think about it in a 3D calculation. It, um, uh, it also is the case that if you're really worried about scalability of your code, you may not want to replicate that directory. It may be that what you want to do is have another level of indirection that says, oh, I'm just going to keep a, a pointer to the set of blocks that live over on you know, the, the, the north part of the machine and the south part of the machine, the east part of the machine, and the west part of the machine, and then there you would have a directory that would point to all the blocks there. So you can do very, it's very flexible, and you can do whatever you want um, in terms of um, trading off the amount of memory that you use and the number of um, dereferences and, and messages that you need to send in order to access the data structures. <clears throat> 
This is also very useful because if you want to have ghost regions around the, the um, blocks that you're calculating on, you can just allocate them to be a little bit bigger than, um, than they need to be for the main, main da data. And those, those ghost regions can store copies of the data that's in the other blocks nearby them, which makes the calculation then very um, simple when you're, when you're going to run through the, uh, the averaging code. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit then about the performance of UPC and then say a little bit about some of the things we're doing in um, research areas um, related to UPC and these PGAS languages. So um, we have a compiler that's built was built here at, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab up the hill, and um, it was it has its own. Uh, um, it, it translates UPC code into C code, so it is a source-to-source -source translator. The advantage of that is very easy then to um, get pretty good performance out of the generated C code because you use whatever compiler for C um, is, uh, is native on the uh, system that you're running on. So it's a pretty flexible way to build a compiler. It tur turns out that it, it generates code for it generates C code and generates calls to what we call the UPC runtime layer. Below that is a communication layer we call GasNet, um, which runs on top of the network hardware. So the only part of the implementation that's really interesting from a parallelism standpoint is this um, is this runtime that calls a communication layer. The runtime also has things to implement those global pointers that I talked about, things like that. So everything above in the the, um, the top two layers is really um, independent of what the network looks like. Um, the things below that are what we have to re-implement with each new architecture. Um, this assumes we have a C compiler on each machine that we can use. So um, it turns out that um, the, there's a GCC implementation, which is actually what I, I recommend using if you want to try out UPC. Um, you can get that if you, you install the, if you're running on one of the NERSC machines, um, they're both the GCC compiler and the Berkeley UPC compiler installed. They both use the same runtime system, so most of the stack is actually common between the two. Um, some other languages that I'll talk about in a minute, including Coray, Fortran, there's an implementation that runs on top of the communication layer, um, a, a, la a language that's much more recently developed by Cray called Chapel. It also uses this um, communication layer. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the performance, and in order to do that, I want to give you some idea of what the difference is between communicating in one of these PGAS languages and communicating in MPI. And when I say MPI, for the purposes of this discussion, this lecture, I'm going to be thinking of MPI in the two-sided model, that is, um, using send and receive. Did, did, uh, did you hear about one-sided communication in MPI in the lecture? Okay, well, if you did, maybe you didn't, you don't remember. Okay, so we'll just think of MPI as two-sided. I will say that because of all of the, um, the, the kind of talks that we've been giving and the results that we've had in getting good performance out of one-sided communication, MPI has put in one-sided communication, and MPI 3 has a new improved one-sided communication that they think will actually be able to, to get the same kind of performance we talk about here, but it's... Uh, um, but I, we haven't, the implementations are still in progress on many of these machines. Okay, so what do we mean by a one-sided um, communication, which is underneath one of these PGAS implementations that's down on the gas net level? Um, when, you, when you have something like a put message, so we think of these as put and get as opposed to send and receive. So there's two different kinds of messages. Either I want to get something from the other side or I want to put something to the other side. And what's in that message is an address in memory and a data payload. The address is going to... Um, so, so we, before we had the, the, the UPC address that might have said what thread ID it is, at this point we've shipped over the message to that thread and we've said what address to read from your memory. So a smart network controller, network interface on one of these systems will actually pick up that message and it knows that the, this, that it can interpret that address, so there's a put operation actually down the, at the hardware level um, that'll write that data into its final memory location. So there's really only the, the copy that's happening between the sender side and the actual user level data structure, the receive side, is the only one that happens. So you can't do any better than that, um, that single copy. In a message passing model, instead what you do um, here is you have a message ID and the same kind of data payload. The message ID then, what does that mean? Well, a message ID is something that's associated with every MPI message, and in order to figure out where that message goes in memory, you have to know where what the receive operation says to do with the message. So when you give a receive operation in MPI, you say, please put the message that I'm receiving into this place in memory by giving it an address in memory, right? Um, so, the, so fundamentally, in this, in this kind of two-sided message, the information about where this data should be written in memory resides in the application program running over here on the host CPU. Now, 
If you pre-post your receives, a, a common sort of uh, optimization strategy for MPI, which means you put the receives kind of up before you need them, that'll go and allocate the memory for those things, and it will say that I'm ready to receive them, so when the message comes in, it'll just get written there. But the, uh, fundamentally, the information, there, there's more matching that has to happen to figure out uh, where this data goes, whereas in the first case, we can just use the lowest level mechanism in the hardware. So this was something that I think wasn't entirely clear when people first started programming these PGAS languages. Languages, as I said, it was really they're really developed for convenience of these random access data structures. But what we have realized over the years is that we, that the fundamental mechanism in a lot of hardware systems in the networks is what we call an, a DMA operation or RDMA for remote direct memory access, um, and that's exactly what you're exposing to the programmer now. So. Um, this shows the difference in bandwidth on the Cray XE6 on the hopper system um, at NERSC and uh, between MPI, which is the green line at the bottom. So this is bandwidth, which means up is good. So there's the MPI bandwidth, um, and there is the UPC bandwidth using both the Cray compiler. So Cray has their own commercial compiler that is um, separate from the Berkeley compiler and the, and the GCC, the, um, the UPC compiler. And the, uh, the, the uh, red line, sorry, the blue line is Berkeley um, and the red line is Cray's. So there's something weird happening here. There's a switchover point that uh, we have uh, used, we have different settings for, um, which we could probably switch. But anyway, um, the main point is there's a big gap here. Um, and this, this little inset shows the relative speed up of UPC over MPI, which is up to about a factor of 10 in bandwidth. Okay, so this, ba this benchmark is a micro benchmark just between two threads, and they're sending data as fast as possible one, from one thread to the other. So you're pushing messages out in the network one after the other as fast as you can. The x-axis is the message size, so here you're sending 8-byte messages. You can't get very good bandwidth when you're sending 8-byte messages, but you get a lot better bandwidth using UPC than you do using MPI, because there's just very little over overhead. And even up to you know, about um, 4K messages, there's still a very big difference between um, UPC and MPI, and that's because of the, this overhead issue and, and the, the, um, lack, of, the um, lack of the need to, to do tag matching and things like that in UPC. Um, these kind of performance numbers, so this is um, GasNet slash UPC at the top and MPI at the bottom. This is on an InfiniBand network. It's a fairly old uh, slide and old data, but it's, uh, we, we see these kinds of gaps on other kinds of networks. Um, this is showing a, the difference in round-trip latency. So blue is um, MPI, which is higher consistently than GasNet, uh, the UPC one, which is lower. And there's a, um, there's a, a, a me medium-sized message, so that 4K message point. When you get to a large enough message, these two things should be the same or very close because the overheads basically are completely amortized. But for these medium-sized messages, um, we, we do see a performance advantage in UPC. Now, why does this help us? I said at the very beginning that you know, these, these PGAS languages are good for random access. Hopefully you've gotten some sense of that from the kind of data structures you can build, graph data structures using pointers and things like that, and you can read and write them directly across the network um, if you need to. Uh, but what is the, the deal with um, this kind of very communication intensive computation like a 3D FFT? So here's what happens in a 3D FFT. You've got a 3D grid of values. You're going to compute FFTs on the rows, FFTs on the columns, and then you're going to transpose the um, array across the processors and compute uh, the FFTs in the, um, the depth direction, sort of get in and out of the screen. Okay? So um, there's a few different approaches you can use. The first one would be what's usually recommended in MPI, which is you finish all your computation, you wait for it all to be ready, you pack all the, the pieces together, and you send a single message from processor one to processor two. So notice that these blue things are not go necessarily going to be contiguous um, with one another on the processors. If one processor, for example, owns this first slab of memory, um, then, then, or actually owns two of these slabs, then the chunk that the blue chunk in the first one and the blue chunk in the second one are not stored next to each other. So you have to pack them together. Um, slab is, uh, well, I'll talk about the last. The, the pencil one is kind of the other extreme where we say as soon as we finish, we've already done the column FFTs, and as soon as we finish a row FFT, we'll immediately send that row off to whatever ever processor or set of processors needs it, and so when, we, when we're going to do the transpose. And so we're sending it right away, um, and so the, the trade-off between these two is that the chunks send fewer messages, same volume in, in all cases, but fewer messages, and the pencil one sends messages, a larger number of messages, but sends them uh, much more quickly. So it overlaps the communication over a much lo longer period of time and allows you to do computation while you're doing communication. 
A slab is sort of in between where you just wait for the chunk of rows that is contiguous in memory and then send, send that chunk. Um, so here's the difference in performance on uh, a blue gene P system uh, running on up to 32,000 cores. So this is something that um, is, a, is very scalable code. Um, and in this particular case, you, you see the, uh, the, the patch slabs is what I called uh, chunk here um, in the original one. And then there's the MPI performance that, um, that is down below the other two. And I think it, we didn't manage to get an MPI point for 32,000 cores. Um, so the UPC implementation was consistently faster than MPI. Um, all of these implementations are using the same locally optimized FFT library. I believe this is FFTW but it, at the bottom, but it may be um, IBM's ESSL, um, which may or may not use FFTW in the bottom. So we use, you can use fast optimized libraries for the local code. Um, and UPC avoids the send and receive overhead, which means that you can send these smaller messages like the pencils um, or the, uh, the little slabs much more quickly than you can in MPI. Um, and here's uh, uh, more performance numbers on, this is on the, uh, an older Cray system that we used to have at NERSC called Franklin. This is a Cray XT4. You see, once again, that UPC has some advantages um, and that actually slabs is uh, faster than packing the slabs together for UPC and that MPI is, uh, um, not, well, so, so for some of these uh, smaller problem sizes, actually MPI does beat UPC, but um, for the larger ones, uh, then uh, the uh, MPI, the UPC wins. So um, I think I'll skip this. We have an implementation, an event driven implementation of, of the HPL benchmark, the LU factorization code used for the top 500 numbers, um, and uh, I have some good performance numbers for that. This is a, a more of a real application. Um, th this is a, a milk the milk code, which is used in quantum chromodynamics, QCD. Um, and here's a comparison. This was some work done by Hong Zhang Shan. I should say a lot of this work was done by a, the, a large group of people on the UPC team. Um, and this is uh, showing the UPC implementation uh, compared to an MPI implementation. And once the UPC op uh, implementation is properly optimized, it uh, outperforms the uh, MPI implementation at very large scales. So to kind of summarize uh, UPC, um, it, as I said before, it's, it was designed to be consistent with the spirit of C as well as being a strict superset of C. Um, and it is um, really designed for high performance to allow you to get transparent access to what the underlying machine looks like. Um, there are a couple of different compilers. There are also vendor compilers. Um, so the first two are open source compilers. And there's an ongoing language specification process that you're welcome to participate in if you're really interested in uh, affecting the, uh, um, the uh, uh, future of what UPC looks like. Um, there will also be a tutorial at Supercomputing this year on high performance programming in UPC. So for more advanced ideas about UPC programming, you can go there. So um, I'm going to talk just about a, a couple of the things that are going on in my research group and others um, related to kind of these, these PGAS languages in general. I won't talk about Chapel or Fortress or X10, um, but X10 from IBM and Chapel from Cray are two very active projects. And these PGAS languages, they have a much more dynamic execution model. So they have this same kind of partition view of the address space and the ability to directly follow pointers sort of um, between them or have distributed arrays, but they're very, um, but th they don't use this SPMD style, which is um, very, very regular. So um, one of the things that we're doing now is looking at um, PyGAS, um, which is combining you know, two, two great tastes that taste great together. Um, there's uh, the, um, the, the Python language, which is obviously a very popular language. Um, what you may not know, it's also very popular in scientific computing. About 10% of the NERSC projects use Python, and that number is growing pretty quickly. Python is typically used to glue different pieces of code together rather than being used as the, as the computational engine underneath these simulations. Um, and of course, PGAS is also really designed for convenience. So PyGAS takes these two, gives you a global address space in, um, inside the Python language. And if you're interested in this, I am actually teaching a graduate course. If you happen to be a Berkeley student, um, I'm teaching a graduate course in parallel languages. And we're going to look at some uh, various parallel languages and then probably talk about the design of uh, this PyGAS language this fall. Um, we also have a um, kind of a non-language version for people who love C++. Um, this has been an ongoing uh, question since actually the very beginning of UPC is when are you going to do UPC++? UPC++ uh, C++ is a very complicated language. Uh, the compilers are very complicated. Uh, we worked for a while with an open source, uh, sorry, a, a closed source compiler called the EDG front end, um, which now has UPC support inside of it. So th that's used in a lot of the vendor compilers. Uh, but what we decided to do in 
in order to avoid uh, the headaches of dealing with this C++ compiler is to have a library-based version. So not quite as elegant as building it into the language, but you can use operator overloading, and um, there's a little bit more overhead than in UPC, as you can see from the graph on the right, but um, we're calling this, the, the, this is part of a project called Dega um, to do a C++-based um, PGAS implementation as a library. And I think the last thing I'll just mention is that um, we are looking at these ideas of PGAS programming inside of a single shared, uh, inside of a node uh, on a, one of these parallel machines, especially when you look at the complexity of what these high performance machines are looking like. So the, um, the Titan system at Oak Ridge National Lab is a bunch of NVIDIA GPUs. Um, can, can, so as, as um, accelerators attached to each one of the compute nodes. Um, and we're seeing this is, this is one of the styles that we may see in, the, in general. But just to kind of extract the, the essential features of PGAS programming, we Remember what we got. We got the ability to point into memory, dereference those pointers back and forth, and um, we also got the ability to control where things lived in memory. So you can imagine now what we call a vertical PGAS model, where we can allocate memory that's, say, in DRAM, uh, and then we can move data in and out of the GPU space and compute on it there. So um, these, this one-sided put-get model is really pretty fundamental. DMA is the underlying hardware mechanism on a lot of these different systems, both inside of the networks, which I talked about before, but when you're moving data to and from accelerators, you're doing it with DMA operations, um, moving data to and from I.O. systems, and so on. So we're looking at these um, kinds of ideas, and um, I think I'll just start with a little bit of philosophy. And I don't know if, if Jim or someone showed this slide before, but this is looking at the top 500 machines over time and what, the, what kinds of machines they were. Um, and roughly speaking, I've divided them into the, the warm colors at the, the upper left. So these were systems that were basically vector-based and shared memory. You could program them using um, mostly using annotated um, serial programs to first approximation, maybe required a little bit more work than that. Um, whereas the message passing ones, which are the more popular ones today, were programmed by completely rethinking the algorithms of the software for parallelism. So I think the question is, as we add more accelerators, as memory becomes more explicit, as the NUMA effects, the performance effects within the shared memory become more and more pronounced, um, what, what will our next programming model look like? And um, you know, I think we need to look at something besides pure message passing, certainly, and OpenMP. Now I think that one possibility is that um, MPI is already adopting some of the PGAS features by putting in one-sided communication. OpenMP, they're looking at affinity control, which is a locality construct very much like kind of a partitioned uh, global address space. So the ideas in PGAS may move into OpenMP and MPI, um, or you can program in a, U, a, a real PGAS model. So anyway, that I will end there and see if there are any questions. Yes? Um, what kind of fault tolerance What kind of what? Fault tolerance. Um, so UPC does not have any fault tolerance built into it right now. It's an interesting research problem that um, we are actually working on as part of the this Dega project has a number of different things that I, that I didn't talk about besides the UPC++, but we are looking at um, fault tolerance using something called containment domains, which are from Matan Eras and his group at University of Texas. Um, and it's a way of kind of wrapping up um, a set of a state and uh, in a, part of, a certain part of the computation and using whatever kind of fault tolerance you want to in that region. So it's not, uh, it's not automatic by any means. It's, it's, a, it's a programmer abstraction for getting fault tolerance. Any other questions? All right. Thanks very much.